Welcome back to Night Mine, friends. It's a warm, rich kind of night. The sort that makes me nostalgic for outdoor adventures, the channel's beginnings, and the kind of mysteries that keep us up while the cicadas sing. Tonight, we're going to visit one of the most thrilling projects and perplexing mysteries we've had the pleasure to cover in recent years. I am Sophie, in case you haven't heard, is over. And I've needed to really take the right amount of time to think this over and get the proper mood to sit down for end project coverage because this story really was a very different animal, and going for a final thoughts run is a challenge I couldn't take lightly. Joining us tonight to send off I Am Sophie is an old friend who's been with us for a previous coverage, Raycon. You might know how much utility and quality I find in Raycon's everyday E25 earbuds already, but as the summer's about to arrive, now is a great moment to discover for yourself. It's more than music. You can use the E25 earbuds to get away from screens while still enjoying your favorite content like podcasts, audiobooks, news, and YouTube videos from certain monstrous content broadcasters you enjoy. Raycon earbuds give you 6 hours of playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, more bass, and the best compact design I've ever seen. They're comfortable and very easy to pause and play, which is very useful for me, since I'll be taking them with me for all the upcoming bike rides and walks I'll enjoy this summer. Because yes, even monsters enjoy some time outside their lair and exercising. Seriously, if you're someone who likes to go on long bike rides, grab a pair of E25 earbuds. You'll free your entire range of motion, and you can just press the side of one of the earbuds to pause and play your music. I've tested them on a few rides already, and they really improve the experience. Break away from the screen and enjoy maximum movement this summer with Raycon's E25 earbuds, and take 15% off your order by going to buyraycon.com forward slash nightmind. That's buyraycon.com forward slash nightmind, or just click the link in the video description box below. Big thanks to Raycon for sponsoring this video, and for joining us to see the end of the I Am Sophie story. That is an odd thing to think about, isn't it? The end of the I Am Sophie story. For some of you, this probably comes as a surprise. Maybe it's a surprise for a lot of you, but it was a surprise to everyone when it was announced, and it is indeed an official declaration by the creator who did step forward. We'll get to that along the timeline when it happens especially because that declaration and public awareness and openness represents a threshold, letting us into an area of study for our coverage we don't often get to indulge in, and it's one that I make a habit to keep on the side until a project is actually over. For now, let's just do a quick review of the story behind I Am Sophie to get re-established. February 13th, 2020 Sophie launches a channel trailer for her new vlogs, introducing herself to YouTube in short form. She's young, popular, talented, the daughter of a millionaire businessman, and she wants to show you her life. February 20th, 2020. The first vlog arrives, bringing us Sophie in her now infamous hot pink business suit. She describes her inspiration for doing this as her friend Ben, who's worked in film for a while, and Sophie is timing her vlog channel quite well. She's just about to launch her clothing line, YRP. We get taken on a small tour of Sophie's home, her belongings, well, her dad's belongings, and she tries to convince us that she has an athletic side to her personality by going to the gym for a boxing session. February 23rd, the YRP collection launches and comes with a website where all the clothing options are apparently sold out by the time anyone had a chance to click. February 27th, Sophie tries to mix being relatable into a video promoting her clothing line behind the scenes with a live on 10 pounds for a day challenge. We meet her friend, Plum, who tags along for the promos and for a miniature vacation in Europe at a high-class villa. And yes, of course they took Sophie's private chat, let's not forget about that. It's in this video we see the first signs of glitching, revealing a girl in her bedroom who will later come to know as Lara. February 29th, Leon Lush on YouTube makes a video about Sophie after receiving a tip-off email from someone named Ben, coincidentally the same name as Sophie's cameraman and videographer friend. March 1st, Sophie responds to Leon Lush in record time, then uses the rest of the video to try showing us she can have fun anywhere, like a normal kind of club atmosphere, as well as high-scale places that she enjoys. Plum is tagging along once again for the journey. At the end, we get plenty of glitches, showing a derelict building with an ominous-looking chair and new shots of Lara. March 5th. Sophie and Plum manage to get in contact with the girl from the footage and went to investigate her home, trying to solve the mystery of how she kept ending up in Sophie's vlogs. Lara is clearly not alright and shows obvious signs of obsession with Sophie. She wears a similar outfit, Sophie's fashion glasses, and has the same positivity as power shirt Sophie wore in a previous video. Sophie's computer specialist friend, Mark, comes over to help figure things out and uncovers an audio file that, when sped up, says, I can see you, Sophie, on repeat. 
A loud banging keeps coming from upstairs, where Lara didn't want anyone going into her room with a closed door. And Lara starts to have a breakdown under questions about the noise, leading Sophie, her manager, Ben, and Mark to leave. Plum, who went upstairs to take a look, is forgotten about. March 11th. A video with a coded title is uploaded, which breaks down to the name Algorithm. Sophie is attempting to make a vlog with Ben, and from here, you probably remember what happens as all hell breaks loose. Mark shows up in his underwear with spots of blood on him, gives a monologue about a worm in his brain feeding on his thoughts, and walks away. He reappears again and again in different rooms alongside our monster, a man with a hand over his face tattooed with the word hate, as Sophie and Ben try to escape. Sophie opens a door that transports them into the rundown building shown in glitches earlier, where they find a tormented and vengeful plum. She lets Sophie know that she's a messed up girl, shrieks while the room fills with some otherworldly backlighting, and dies by Mark's hand. Ben soon meets the same fate, and Sophie is tied to the chair. Mark appears with a lot more blood on him, followed by Lara wearing Sophie's pink suit. Several shots appear in rapid succession, letting us know through imagery that Lara is taking Sophie's place, and our monster, hate, is a contributing factor. We watch all of this through a camera trained on a screen, making us aware of a new character witnessing all of this. March 17th. The new arc of the I Am Sophie story begins as we see Sophie's vlogs uploaded with Lara taking her place. The mystery character records these anomalies, making sure to catch the glitch in footage of Sophie as she met her demise, and the hate comments on YouTube that came with her vlogs. The YRP brand has also been switched to OPW, Old, Poor, Weak. Before long, we receive distress footage from Lara, spliced into her version of the YRP promo video, asking the uploader, who will later come to know as Simon, to watch the next disc in full. She's racked with remorse for the things that she's done, but she needs his help one more time. This brings us to the start of Lara's vlogs, a stark contrast to Sophie's. March 28, 2020. The first of Lara's vlogs is uploaded by Simon, but they reveal that Lara herself began uploading to YouTube on June 2nd, 2019. Lara also lives alone with her dad. Her mother passed away when she was three from involvement in an accident. She does have a cat too, which contradicts her first appearance. In the same video, we see vlog 12, Lara's last upload from February 13th, 2020, the same day Sophie's channel trailer was published. It appears to play as an ad on a video Lara goes to watch. Later in her vlog, we see a cut of Sophie's footage in Lara's video, right around the same moment that glitches of Lara appeared in Sophie's. The next video gives us footage of Lara on her phone in the dark from November 10th, 2019, unaware she's being recorded in vlog 9. Hate appears wearing a white sweatshirt and glimpses after Lara leaves the room to go somewhere with her father. June 21st, 2019 was Lara's second vlog, a smoky eye makeup tutorial, which features Lara in a white sweatshirt. We catch footage of her talking to a friend on the phone asking for help with her recording. This is the voice of Simon, as we come to hear him later. Lara's eye makeup tutorial produces a strong result, which is reminiscent of Sophie's appearance in her first vlog. The video ends with Lara receiving an anonymous email requesting that she play the guide to being young, rich, and powerful. Next, we see Lara on July 11th, producing her first livestream after getting many more requests from the anonymous viewer to play the game, and the language in the email is strange. Not just because it tells Lara, love your content bro, but because it's the same language and signature as the email from Ben sent to Leon Lush. Lara boots up the game and we see the YRP triangle and title of Sophie's first video. As Lara plays through the intro, she sees and comments on glitches that we know are snapshots from the future of Sophie's demise. The pixel game plays out, going through the events of Sophie's first vlog, introducing us to the idea of decapitated horses and the legend of the sea monster, Skila. When Pixel Sophie enters the conservatory, Lara learns the flowers smell like rancid meat and stomach acid. A glitch occurs on screen, another that she sees and comments on. It's part of the sequence from Mark's appearance in the house, describing the worm in his brain. You may remember how the rest of this goes. Plenty of references to hell, death, and corpses on the plane, followed by a dramatic plane crash that's glossed over, bringing in the gym sequence. The game almost seems to crash at the end, leaving Lara with a continue option and we pick up in Vlog 4. Lara's playthrough this time begins with what appears to be a precognitive replacement piece. The edits, the sky footage, the overall makeup of the intro as Lara reads, it's all reminiscent of Sophie's intro for her second vlog, now starring Lara. You may remember if you've seen this before that it's at this point the game begins talking to Lara, asking her questions and waiting for vocal answers. When Pixel Sophie fails her 10 pounds challenge for the day, a distorted version of her phone video footage plays, now with different phrasing. Hey Lara! I'm super annoyed today's challenge didn't go as expected, but you're gonna do it again and I'm sure it'll go a lot better. 
The end of the game brings Lara to tears as it reads her feelings. She breaks away to call Simon, who asks for her to send him the game so he can take a look and deal with it, and instructs Lara to stop playing. This ushered in our reveal of Simon, the mystery uploader watching Lara's old footage. Video plays of him on webcam, obviously recorded without his knowledge, just as we witnessed from Lara during the glitches in Sophie's vlogs. He receives the game from Mark, yes, the same Mark from earlier, asking to look into it, because it's secretly malware meant for data digging. Simon decides to send it to Lara anonymously as a gameplay request, probably out of pettiness for helping out Lara without her agreeing to get drinks with him. In the following video, we get some scrambled shots that are a mix of images of Hate and Lara together, Hate wearing Sophie's clothes and some other pieces. Pixel Sophie talks to Lara from the computer. We get glitch interruptions showing YRP Lara from the future, and footage of someone cutting out their eyes, which is later revealed to be the fate of everyone who buys YRP merch, or an equally violent end. Pixel Sophie asks Lara what she wants out of life, and we receive the most shocking moment since the end of the first arc. The voices of Sophie, Plum, and YRP Lara from the home investigation outside Lara's room, suggesting that she was inside the whole time. August 31st, 2019. Lara returns in a vlog in the backyard, talking about how her father let go of her job, but despite that, she's doing alright. Since the livestream of the YRP game, she's recovered, but the air in her room has become thick, and she's having strange dreams of a man in a suit with a disfigured face who sits at the edge of her bed. There's something else in the room that she doesn't like, crouching in a corner, and the man's presence is comforting. Strangely comforting, too, is the air in the room, which, while making her sick, is at the same time kind of alluring. Continue is an interesting upload, showing Lara in bed while Sophie thanks her for a number of things, which all suggests that Lara is giving away herself and her life. Sophie teases about the transformation process underway, while everyone is watching, showing many of us online who have covered I Am Sophie. The surprising plane crash sequence comes in at the end. Sophie's prophecy of Lara performing the 10 pounds for a day challenge comes true next through an app called YRP Mobile, driving her to steal 10 pounds from her father and burn it. Literally burning daddy's money. You may remember one of the lost videos comes next, Pop Goes the Weasel. This showed footage overlaid in the YRP mobile window, with Pixel Sophie singing Pop Goes the Weasel while Lara appeared to be crying over the head of a horse that she decapitated, making a connection between the moment in the YRP game and Sophie's first vlog. A character named David makes an appearance next on the phone, and he's told by Pixel Sophie that it's time to tune in. A dead cat appears after, then some haunting footage of Sophie in the conservatory and flashes of art depicting the myth of Skila. Now, the moment we left off on last time, I can see you all. The character of David puts on a VHS tape from Kratius Industries, in the same commercial style and music as the I Am Sophie uploads. Howard Moore introduces himself, the concept of digital women in some form with details left out in cuts, and says the head of production, Chloe, will get things started. Chloe is revealed shortly to be Sophie's manager, as well as Simon's contact for the company he used to work for, where he wrote the code. Oh, and Mark works there too, which makes Simon, Chloe, and Mark all part of Kratius Industries, which created a Sophie. And Simon had a photo reference for Chloe to use as well. We see a digital Sophie in shots between the image of Sophie in her first vlog as well as the overlap of the YRP game. And if all this wasn't enough revelation of plot advancement in one video, Simon is shown beaten to death and his flamingo plush covered in blood. This represents a massive turning point in I Am Sophie. We hadn't been introduced to the idea before this video that Sophie might have been literally fake, as in manufactured, unless some of her statements in the beginning vlogs were subtle clues like, am I being real, and this particular statement. In a world where everything is so fake and digital, it can be easy to forget what's real, what's true and good. Scrutinizing this one video and all the content that came before is enough to drive a person mad. More was needed to really see the picture come into focus. But with Simon dead, who was going to serve the story? Viewers waited to see and were rewarded with a really strange surprise. Max Stream Pranks. In December, a tweet was posted and pinned. New and old, it begins again. 13-2-2021, referencing February 13th of this year. The account was also renamed Max, described as sold to the highest bidder, and we were told, you are owed everything. The new channel owner began responding to people, letting them know that there really was someone different at the wheel now. Sub to Max coming soon, they said, and informed someone else that they were the winning bidder for the Twitter account. This turned out to be the owner of a new channel, Max Stream Pranks, which premiered on, you guessed it, February 13th, 2021. 
There have only ever been three Max Pranks videos, one of which was deleted on YouTube for the same reasons we lost Pop Goes the Weasel, but the two standing videos were the uploads of real story consequence. The missing video, Cow Gets What It Deserves, has Max apparently engaging in cattle mutilation, but instead of a cow's head at the end, a horse's head was shown, keeping up the previous sacrifice theme. The first video was a shock, answering a question for us. It was Max who killed Simon, all because he took a walk in the wrong place at the wrong time. Max followed him home, smashed his garden pots, broke in, and pranked Simon by beating him to death. With the cow video that followed, the theme of Max Dream Pranks was quickly established. We had a new sort of Sophie character, now a psychopath who filmed his evil for entertainment online and called it a prank, another branch of criticism for the more disgusting people who go viral online. The third video is the big twist. Homeless guy gets what he deserves. Max says on Twitter that he just got sent an old instructional VHS with a device, showing an image of Howard Moore from the Karate Industries video. Howard Moore's tape this time introduces the Glaucus device, another reference to the myth of Skila. Glaucus was a mortal turned into a sea god who fell in love with Skila, but was ultimately rejected by her. Max sneaks up on a homeless person, beats him, and forces the Glaucus device into his head. The result is very unexpected. Huh. What? What are you doing to me? Ah, ah. Ah. Wait, no, don't go! It's not safe! <sighs> Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Where am I? How did I? That video was posted on February 19th, 2021. There have been no videos since. Viewers waited a while for something to occur, and on April 5th, there was an update on Twitter from a totally different account. I miss this guy, but feel less hateful. Felt like I said what I needed to say. Thanks for everything. Sorry for the unanswered questions. This is Tom Ransom, the creator of I Am Sophie. If he seems familiar to you at all, it's because he's the co-owner of MMA On Point, a YouTube channel dedicated to coverage of MMA fighting. With Sophie's boxing training in her first vlog a well-written piece in which she tried to fluff her personality and a clever subtle nod to the identity of her creator? Maybe. But what we know for certain is that, yes, this really is him. He's the guy. Here he is with the cast, including a rare face appearance from Ben the cameraman. And if you want an extra credential reference, Tom won a first prize for best television pilot slash webisode for I Am Sophie at the Rhode Island International Film Festival last year. Yeah, I Am Sophie was submitted around to film festivals and won an award. <laughs> We're not crazy when we say this thing is awesome. Now, I don't make a habit of discussing who the creators are for the projects we cover. Like a lot of creators themselves, I prefer the work to stand by itself, its origin relatively unknown, to keep the art as its own entity. But Tom did step forward, and from what we see here, he needed to, because this announcement needed to get out there. And frankly, the atmosphere had to exist for asking questions, which is what he said he would be doing with Enbird after his announcement. The way this ended, we needed to break the unfiction seals and ask what was up directly. Although, Tom did answer partly for his decision to just call it finished there through this reply tweet. I had co-written an arc for Max, one I was really proud of, and anxiety got to me and I realized I could never achieve what I really wanted to and 100% just shit the bed. That's fair. 
it wouldn't be the first time vision couldn't make its way into reality for a project in the field. Often our ideas get bigger than our ability to carry through on them and we do have to scale back. And if there's more to it, we're about to hear about it. But first, while Tom is about to be frankly honest about I Am Sophie, I need to do the same. I have a strict code about looking at what creators say regarding what their work means or where a project is going. Anything outside the actual material that could help me with deciphering things is usually off limits while the project is live. I don't ever want to break that code. I only ever want to do it once a project is over, and only when I'm done forming my own thoughts on the material and giving it my best shot. And when I'm in that process, I don't like to do theories. Whenever I cover something mysterious, I want to find the pieces, collect the evidence, put together a solid case, and say, this is what's happening, this is why, these pieces all fit, and if you think I'm wrong, step up and we'll give Tom Ransom a real fight to comment on, because I already bruised my knuckles on the facts of this case for so much longer than its runtime that it's ridiculous. <laughs> Basically, give me the material to put it all together, or at least a good 75-80%, to 80 and I'll go for the puzzle solve. Give me enough information to make the call. But sometimes we run into situations like this one, where I just don't think we have enough to comfortably do that and would instead just be theorizing. There are a few projects in this field I have loved, obsessed over, and tired myself out trying to solve like I Am Sophie. Few series ever give us the quality, dedication, speed of upload, intrigue, scares, and fresh ideas and presentation of I Am Sophie. This was a revitalizing project, invigorating to my creative spirit, something I was constantly excited and eager to see more of. I couldn't wait for the next big revelation to drop and have enough material to make an update video just so I could talk about everything with you. This project was fantastic. It is fantastic. And not being able to see it finished is a tragedy. Not just because it should have been in a just world where Tom was able to carry through with it, but because the way it's ending, how it's ending, and where it's ending, it kind of hurts the final product. And just saying that, it brings back the pain of knowing this is not the final product, because we're not going to see it. But this is what we have to go on. This is what's been left on stage. And if we're judging by that criteria, which is what we need to do responsibly, the picture isn't that pretty at the end. And I absolutely wish I didn't just have to say that, but I need to. When you're as brilliant as I am Sophie, you've got to take the criticism with the praise, and the moment I can see you all was uploaded and the digital Sophie was presented, the story became so complicated and opened so many possibilities that nothing short of Tom's full plan would work. It was necessary to go the distance to wrap everything up in a satisfying way at that point. And we're just not going to get that, which is painful. We needed it to have concrete tie-downs, and the switch to Max Dream Pranks was such a jarring change in style and presentation that only a full arc could have made it truly fit. As it stands right now, we don't see a box with enough pieces to get a truly coherent picture and say, I see this, instead of just, I think I see this. There's so much about this plot that can't be explained using the material at hand, and I've really tried to connect the dots. The best I could give you right now are theories that would depend on future evidence we're never going to get, and some thematic observations that we've covered already. Like Simon and Mark being lonely losers who use their skills and technology to objectify women and create monsters, the myth of Skila being directly related to that, people becoming the monsters they worship online, eyeballs being the real monetary system in today's society, and a lot of viral stars being driven to popularity not because they're good, but because they're egomaniacal cash-flashing caricatures of human beings that are so easy to hate, which is what conjured the hate monster in the first place, the true algorithm representing the internet. Hatred. The desire to see people like Sophie torn to pieces and little people like Laura raised up. It's not our loving eyes we give to celebrities like Sophie, it's our hate views. A view is a view and a click is a click no matter what you feel, and numbers add up and drive the things that trend, so the algorithm listens. Tom himself said in a Reddit post ages ago that I Am Sophie was going to be a six-part narrative, and we are definitely not at six parts by the time this ended. All we have now is whatever Tom and the cast are willing to tell us, and for that opportunity, we have Enbird to thank, as well as Tom himself. So, thank you, Enbird. For those who don't know Enbird, he also covers some stuff in the field. Give him a look later and check out his source video, I Am Sophie. It all ends here, especially if you like behind-the-scenes footage. Now, let's open the puzzle box, collect whatever pieces came out of Enbird's cast and crew interview, and see if we can make connections that we couldn't before. Enbird's first question is actually straight for the bullseye. What was the original ending to I Am Sophie? The answer is very surprising. 
the, the the actual ending the true ending is actually in is actually is actually there the max stream stuff was supposed to kind of arc that and get to that mm. ending but the true ending of, of sophie is actually when the trigger is pulled the uh, the homeless man's head gets splattered right uh, across the pavement so that's the actual true ending so it, it is there it's just you know as it got to the point where things stopped being linear and things started becoming all over the place that's mm -hmm. actually where it was going to curve back and come back around for oh, the okay man. wait 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 this moment from the end of are you being you is the real ending and it's the homeless man that max found maybe i'm missing some other footage that had a representation of a gunshot in this manner but this is the only one i can remember okay interesting let's keep going with this that was a it was a really great sequence the whole going from the mansion to the attic and and how everything kind of changed that was probably one of my favorite scenes as well was was that i guess is that, that is that is the tilted room is that is that the actual tilted room the tilted room yeah. all right cool <laughs> we were like amber do you mind if, can we just get you in a bin bag do some stuff <laughs> yeah, i didn't bat an eyelid you were like yeah yeah i'll do yeah i'll do yeah i'll do bin bag <laughs> so that's the real tilted room Okay, in some odd spatial anomaly sort of way then, I suppose Lara's bedroom and that area truly were the same place. That would also explain why Lara kept having nightmares in which there was somebody crouched in the corner that she didn't like. Who's crouched in the corner in the tilted room when Ben and Sophie end up in it? Plum. There was a lot of questions about the plot, but I've narrowed it down to, to the most reoccurring ones. Um, <laughs> oh, and, no. Here we go. I mean, obviously, if there's something that um, that you don't want to answer, that's completely fine. So the missing Lara vlog, there was one that we never saw. I think it was number 11. I was wondering if there was anything in that that we would have gotten more into her character or her situation and stuff like that so just to be honest you know the, the the actual ending of that vlog was something that i really wanted to film with emily and bb together because it was the transcendence of mm. them into one um, yeah. which ultimately you see at the end of of the the horror house show um so it was supposed to be a sort of moment of coming together and becoming one if you will so it was this idea that ultimately you know if that's kind of who you want to be everyone becomes the same thing and nothing mm -hmm. is interesting and that was kind of the ending of vlog 11 essentially was going to be them coming together and and um you know you see that in the profile picture in the poster of mm -hmm. i'm sophie it's them sort of combined yeah. and becoming one so that was the ending um that ultimately uh i couldn't get to film which was really sad was and that's like kind of why i went and everything and stuff like that that's why i went on hiatus because i couldn't get it done and yes yeah, so i kind of tried to bring it back with with max stream and tie a few things together ultimately i just realized that you know that the magic of it was was gone and i went into building elaborate cgi scenes that i spent a lot of time on this computer here building and so i built the mansion and i was building scenes to try and replicate what we had done but in a virtual world mm -hmm. and i looked at it and i just thought uh, i don't think yeah. anyone will like this okay so that answers three things First, we know what Vlog 11 was now, and if we'd actually seen that, then it probably would have given us a view of Pixel Sophie becoming more or less the flesh and blood Sophie, if that is what Tom means in terms of Emily being there with BB. But either way, it's a logical progression of what we were witnessing all the way along in Lars' vlogs, and this explains the sudden halt in uploads. And Tom built a CGI mansion, he said. That place the homeless man recognized was probably Sophie's house. Which just brings us new questions about how it is that he was even familiar with it, but now we know what the location was. Also in, I believe it's the last episode, uh, we see Simon sitting there giving Chloe, the, the manager, his specifications for, I guess, this... Uh, well, Cradius Industries, the whole... I, I, I'm going to ask this question now. AI female companion... <laughs> Yeah, to, I mean, they weren't, they're not supposed to be like sex bots. Or yeah, anything. Okay. I, I saw that one. I saw that flying around everywhere. It was just supposed to be companionship yeah. models. You know, a lot of different characters were supposed to tie together. Mm. Mark, you know, obviously works there along with Simon, and that was their relationship. David, who was played by Nathan Barnett. By the yeah. way, Nathan Barnett is like the coolest and probably yeah. one I of was... the most like famous people i've ever spoken i was to actually talking to him last night we were playing video games together as we do <laughs> um and he was saying that he uh his character was lara's dad 
Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 So so he said that there was a lot more to his scenes and stuff like that. And he yeah. was kind of talking me through it. But um I thought that was also really interesting how Lara's dad was a employee of Kratius Industries and and, and that stuff. Whoa, 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 whoa. David was Lara's dad working for Kratius Industries. That's the role Nathan Barnett was brought into play? Now I'm genuinely upset we didn't get to see how that was supposed to work out. Oh man, that would have been... Oh, that's, that's a lot of revelation that we would have seen in live time and flipped out over. And it would have raised another 15 questions or so. <laughs> and so, so the Sophie that we saw from the beginning, was that Simon's creation or was that real Sophie? Like when did it switch from real life to Simon's companion. Yeah, so it was the Sophie character was based on a real girl that died in a plane crash. And uh, Simon had taken information from that plane crash and that broadcast of this girl, this uh, millionaire's daughter, billionaire's daughter who died, died in a plane crash. And then he obviously he popped it into um, his algorithm and then the algorithm did its magic and turned uh, turned the whole thing upside down and sort of infested minds and leaked onto the internet and kind of became the series that you saw mm. from the start. So it's, it's super intertwined. There's lots of different links, but yeah. that's essentially the origin of Sophie, that she was a person. Uh, the, the Sophie we saw in the series was, was, was a, uh, was not real. It, it gets messy. It gets really <laughs> messy. We had some meetings. We had some meetings where uh, Tom would explain what was going on. And uh, it was, <laughs> yeah, I remember being like, you know, there's that meme of all the maths floating around yeah, the guy's yeah. face. It's, it's just like that. <sighs> okay. I was thinking it could have been something like that. But I didn't want to jump on that conclusion, because in my eyes, taking the leap in saying that Flesh and Blood Sophie might have been a paranormal anomaly generated by Simon's AI work would have been a running jump to make as far as believable connections go. I would have been jumping out on a limb to make any sort of connection like that. And I was scared to, because it would have just been pure theory to me. And as far as Sophie being connected to the plane crash as a victim goes, the only hint we ever got for that outside the pixel game comes from Tom himself during an interview with Inside a Mind. When Tom was asked what the plane crash was about, and he said that Simon's reference had to come from somewhere. If you watched that video, you could have guessed this, but it was while the project was live. From the material inside the project itself, it would have been a very lucky guess. <sighs> The biggest hurdle in making evidence-based connections was the timeline, because you have Pixel Sophie and AI Sophie, and it's very difficult to gauge which came first. Because remember, Simon didn't even open the game Mark sent him. He sent it on to Lara right away, and only after Lara's experience with it did he get directly involved and have an awareness. Then later, we have literal flesh and blood Sophie, with a very real Ben, a very real Plum, Lara, Chloe, even Mark. Originally, the only way I made the timeline work in my head was like this. Mark creates the game, inspired by someone he used to know, Sophie. Because remember, their exchange in Lara's house leads you to believe they actually did know each other when they were younger. Now I'm here with Mark. Mark is like Gandalf Bart for computers. Like, we went to school together. He's like my nerdy friend, a complete computer whisperer. I didn't think that you knew who I was. Don't be silly, yeah. You're my friend Mark. And because Mark and Simon are the same kind of petty, lonely guy, he might have cooked up the game himself as an act of cruelty towards an old crush. He sends the game to Simon. Simon sends it to Lara, then looks into it, discovers Sophie. He creates the AI inspired by the character in the game, maybe to torment Mark as another petty Simon behavior for the game that he sent to him, which then in turn curse Lara. It would explain why he goes behind Mark's back to get the order from Chloe. And then, through the same horror that's turning Lara into Sophie, some other girl who actually fits Sophie's look in the game completes the infection, becomes Sophie, and puts out her vlogs making them in the cell of the videos. Then Lara, being possessed and fueled by jealousy and hate, comes to take her place, after all this time being obsessed and going to horrifying lengths to play the YRP game on mobile and get what Pixel Sophie promised. As far as Simon's reference goes, I figured he could have gotten it anywhere. 
Look up blonde, blue-eyed, slim woman on the internet and just pick a girl, any girl, any bone structure you like, then call it a reference and you get what you're after. This is the only way I could explain how Mark, who passed along the game, was so relaxed when meeting the literal Sophie, but not Chloe, who helped design the AI version. And that's really not the only spot you can kind of poke at and ask why there's a hole in the theory, which is what made trying to go for the solve so incredibly hard until now. And still, even with Tom's explanation, I've got questions. Like how, again, Mark even got wrapped up in this at all, and how the pixel game came to be if Simon was the one making twisted digital versions of a dead girl. How was Chloe even okay with everything happening when she took the order and made an AI Sophie? And now she's being the manager of the real thing? And if AI Sophie came first, who even made the game? It's... it's a lot of questions, <laughs> admittedly. But this is how much story was cooked up during the runtime as it was going on. Did you get everything out of I Am Sophie that you wanted to? And did you finish the story that you wanted to tell? Was there anything left unsaid that you wish you could have done? I'm disappointed in myself that I didn't get it where I wanted it to be in the end. And I'm also disappointed in myself that I, let, I felt like I let people down um, when, when, I, when it came to the end of it. Um, as well uh, and just kind of just giving giving up on it ultimately it's a story of the isolation in which being a full-time youtuber gets you to that lonely place massively personal project because it is basically a series that has culminated in my life as like a youtuber not a famous youtuber not a big influencer but a, a large brand where i talk about masculinity and i talk about fighting that kind of hatred for me as well and i'm nobody you know and and they would comment on you kind of got me to that position where i wanted to create a story based entirely on hate and what the algorithm does to your life most of the stuff that you actually see in this project are fabricated from the very nightmares that i was having the tilted room is something that i still dream about almost every night so i think generally personally the reason why i decided to, to call it quits because i kind of felt like it's always going to be a problem as long as you work in youtube it, this is always how i'm going to feel I think, I, again, this just goes straight back into the what I was talking about, wanting more. After the success of it, I wanted to do more and more and more and produce more stories and, and get really entangled in it. And ultimately, I just realized that I was doing exactly the same thing I was doing with my work. I was just making an absolute web and getting lost in it and actually forgetting about life outside of the internet. And I realized very recently, it's just that I need to, to just take a bye to it. And sadly, that had to be abrupt. But mm -hmm. it also, I also felt like it was a good way of saying goodbye. I think it's a, a big thing to note that it's an ongoing struggle. Like it's not, I mean, the story being a commentary on YouTube as a whole, it doesn't end, right? So yeah. it, it either goes on forever or you stop it when you want to stop it. And I think doing it on your terms rather than continuing to push out something that you feel like you either have to do and you don't want to or something that the entire uh, not saying that you're not proud of the series but but putting out content for the sake of an audience and not for yourself mm. isn't something that you should be doing and you know what it's absolutely all right just to take a bite i don't know if you're listening tom but this really applies to anyone and everyone youtube is a struggle it is and jobs or daily life routines that we've come into or picked up they often become a struggle in the same fashion that YouTube can for those of us who host channels. They can absorb us or overgrow their bounds on our lives and our time, and it doesn't leave a ton of room for other pieces of us to come out. I don't think it flies over anybody's head that Tom has spent his YouTube years on a channel dedicated to MMA fighting, and then suddenly he comes out swinging with an unfiction project like I Am Sophie. Would you ever have expected that looking at him from his online presence, that this was the guy behind it all? Brilliance can and often does come from places you don't expect. And we get surprised and will keep getting surprised because the same rules of what would surprise people about ourselves applies to others. Look at the poster in Emily's room. Looks like a palmistry poster, right? And while she's in chat, a rabbit hops across the bed. Did you expect the actress for Sophie to maybe be into palmistry or spirituality and have a pet rabbit over something like a cat or a small dog? I'm just saying, people have more depth than you realize. They really do, and often, more talents than you could ever expect. But we may not get to see them for the same reasons they don't get to display them. Look what happens when they do, though. 
and even when it's only just a bite compared to what they've got going on most of the time. Despite how this project ended and the impact that does leave on the final review, nothing, nothing can take away how brilliant this story was and the quality of so many aspects of it. How amazing the editing, the performance, the setup, the intrigue, the horror, all of it was as it was running. This whole crew came together to make an awesome experience that had us thrilled for months. I'm never going to forget I Am Sophie. Finished or not, I'm still going to point at it many times in the future and say, See this? Learn from this. This is what damn good unfiction looks like. For an unfinished project that had me banging my head against the wall sometimes trying to figure out what the hell was going on, it still earned top shelf placement in my heart and my mind. I wish I could have been in this call personally, just to tell them live. You all set the bar. Be proud. Don't ever doubt that what you created was anything less than top of its class. And it's okay to do this stuff on the side and get a few bites in, because you take one hell of a bite when you do it. And if getting absorbed or overburdening yourself is ever a worry, believe me when I say, a bite is often all you ever need to take. We tend to appreciate the shorter projects that came, put on a quick show, took their bow to a round of applause more often than you think. It actually is a running joke in this field of, oh boy, we're on hiatus, again, for another six months. Ah uh, gee, how long until this on Fiction Project ends? <laughs> One of the greatest examples in our field took eight years to wrap up. They didn't plan it, but we were still there for them at the end. What I'm saying is, if you're ever hungry for more, Please, absolutely come back. We will be waiting for you. And hey, speaking of people doing extra creative things. Are you guys working on any future projects? How can people find you and support you and, and continue following along with uh, your respective journeys in the industry? Well, Tom and I, well, we, 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 yes, we would love to do something in the future. We'll say this, perhaps it's best. Uh, we Obviously, if we do do something, you won't know till it's happening, baby. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I've been doing a, a bit of filming for, for a horror film recently. Um, I'm not sure when that's coming out. Maybe next year. Oh. So I'm, I'm not sure how much I'm allowed to say about it. Um, but you, you'll see me marking it up. And I'm, I'm doing a play uh, soon. So hopefully theatres remain open um, and, and I'll get to do that. Awesome. I did a horror film and uh, there were a lot of uh, adverts in the lockdown and commercials. And then uh, theatres are picking up now. And I uh, have my own shop now and jewelry awesome. nice. yes i make jewelry now and, and crystal jewelry and i heal crystal with the crystal myself and others as well i'm at drama school now so i'm not well i'm working on like projects within within there but it's only next year that they're going to be public but a few of my friends we've set up like a film company called lonely giant film company if you want to give us a follow yeah and so we're just making bits and bobs i just started directing a documentary and like trying my hand at other things within the creative field of film yeah i've um, i've got some shorts going around the circuit at the minute and the festivals and stuff that seems to be doing really well so that's really exciting and yeah just bits and bobs really nothing it's obviously been locked down hasn't it so everything's been really slow or at least slowed down a lot but it's been really interesting during projects that have been more virtual based because I've done quite a few projects where you're having to film yourself so yeah it's been interesting to see how the industry has kind of had to adapt. So I guess over lockdown kind of just um, got drunk one night and I thought I'd try my hand at writing. Performed it as like a little 10 minute scratch night thing with my cousin <laughs> and then yeah it kind of did, did well-ish. People laughed, which is a good sign. Yeah, we were like, let's turn this into a one-hour play. And then that kind of brief period where lockdown was kind of eased in autumn, I did like this, it was like a detective role where I was, you know, busting drug lords and stuff, which is fun. So that's going to be on Amazon Prime. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, yeah, you can you can follow me on MMA on Point. You can also buy Venom gear using the code MMA on Point. You can also buy. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, can I? Um, I might put my bank account details up, and if anyone wants to send me cash, <laughs> just send me some money. That'd be really nice. Uh, well, <laughs> for those people watching who would like to support the cast and crew of I'm Sophie, all the links and businesses and everything mentioned will be in the description. Please go support everyone. They have been amazing through this whole series, and they deserve it. So thank you in advance. By the way, since Enbird's video, Bibi Lucille has announced she's performing a one-woman comedy titled Meet Cute at the Hannah and Chickens Theatre in August. 
I'm not sure if it's the piece you just described making, but if you're in London or near it from August 15th to August 17th of this year, you can catch her performance and support her. I'll toss that link in the video description for all you friends in the UK or those who will be passing through at a fortunate time. Am I really satisfied in the completion of the picture left in front of us? As the kind of guy who does the sort of thing I do and thinks about every little bit of connective tissue trying to answer questions, no, I can't say that I am. Do I feel satisfied with I Am Sophie as an unfiction experience, a horror series, and a groundbreaking project as a viewer, and a guy who's seen a lot more of this stuff than the average person? Hell yes! Honestly, you can just break off the entirety of the project after Sophie's trip to the Tilted Room, call it a fantastic short horror story, and be a legend forever. Lara's arc alone was brilliant. You could have broken that off as its own thing, and it still would have been a legend. <laughs> it adds a lot more and brings us in for another dose of freakouts. And while the unexpected appearance of a creepy video game could have fallen into any of the pitfalls that this trope often does, you danced right over them. And BB's performance as Lara sold the deal and made a commission on top of it. Bringing in Simon and Mark during this part did add some confusion to the story. But it provided more dimension and wrote more on the topic of how we view other people and regard them with technology, especially for the purposes of wish fulfillment and dehumanization. And Max Dream could have had a long run, but again, its commentary was not lost on us. And it fits right in with the idea of Sophie and the algorithmic monster of hate that often fuels the internet. I Am Sophie is the kind of project that makes me feel like talking about it for 5, 10, even 15 more minutes here. I don't want to leave the microphone, I still feel like I have things to talk about, and then I want to. I still love it. Flaws and unfinished status be damned. It got messy, confusing, even convoluted. There are pieces of the plot that you can pick apart and even poke a hole in, yes. And none of it diminishes its high points. This painting may never be complete, but the parts of it that were filled in still mesmerize. They still captivate. They still inspire, and they show artistry of people I wish entered the game ages ago. Dan, Tom, if you're excited about the idea you've got right now and you know you can pull it off, go for it. Please do. Unfiction or not, you've got what it takes. You've shown it, you've proven it. We will be here at the ready to cheer you on. And as for the cast and crew, keep on being creative. The best of luck to you all with your endeavors. And thanks for bringing us an excellent project and some wonderful scares. I'd like to give Raycon another thank you for sponsoring this video and coming along for the I Am Sophie ride, and all of you for watching. Major thanks to my supporters on Patreon who empower the content on Nightmind and the operation of the Nightmind Index for unfiction projects, cataloging new and emerging creations. You can support the work here on YouTube and on the Index by joining Patreon for just $2 a month, which lets you into the Patreon community and gets your name at the end of every major video. Stick around to see the names of all the creatures of the night who made this Sophie wrap-up possible. And if you're not subscribed but enjoy viewing Nightmind, consider subscribing to make sure that new content ends up in your feed. That's all for tonight, everyone. Thanks for joining me in the dark again this evening. Once more, I'm Nick Nocturne, and like I hope will happen for the minds and talent behind I Am Sophie, I'll be seeing you all again real soon. Sleep tight.